All right, so by a show of hands, who here liked space when they were young? Okay, great, because I, for one, thought that space was boring. In fact, I even remember going to a stargazing event where, contrary to other kids, I would actually point the telescope to airplanes rushing through the sky, which is a pretty dumb thing to do, right? Um, but when I was 13, I watched a movie on Apollo 13, which turned my perception of space upside down. It was then that I actually wanted to become an astronaut, and so for the next couple of years, I searched for opportunities that would help foster my passion and interest for space. And what I've discovered from someone who used to think that space was the most boring thing to now someone vigorously pursuing it as my career is that surprisingly, space is for everyone. And no, you don't have to be a space or science genius just to be involved, but rather my contention is that it is relevant to our daily lives and anyone, anyone from any background can be involved. We shouldn't outright assume those common stereotypes, such as, oh, space is a waste of time and money, or it's simply not worth our attention. No, no, no. So let's go on a journey of exploration into the unknown tonight and see what we discover. But before I talk about some of the unconventional ways that spaces benefit our daily lives, I want to mention a true story on the use of money and scientific work that Dr. Ernst Stillinger, the Associate Director at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, wrote to a Zambia-based nun back in the 1970s. The story goes like this. So about 400 years ago, there lived a count in a small town in Germany who gave a large part of his income to the poor and sick in his town. But one day, the Count met a strange man who, in his laboratory, grounded lenses from small pieces of glasses, mounted these lenses in tubes, and then used these gadgets to view very tiny, small objects. As you would have guessed, the Count was particularly fascinated, and so the Count hired him. The townspeople, however, were pissed off. You know, they were like, we are dying and suffering from this plague here, while he is funding that man for a useless hobby. The Count remains firm, though. He said, I give you as much as I can afford, but I'll continue to support this man because I know that someday something great will come out of it. Indeed, something great did come out of it, the microscope. And oftentimes we ponder why the billions of dollars used in space you know, why isn't it used to feed hungry children? Why isn't it used to help the homeless or to tackle other earthly problems? Don't we have enough problems to deal with at home already? But I think what this story of the count and microscope represents is the very paradigm we as society face today into investing into space. And sure, often what we see includes astronauts flying into space or SpaceX launching rockets, but it's surprising how often we overlook the subtle yet tangible benefits that it brings to society. I believe it first enables us to understand our planet better, to deepen our appreciation for life, humanity and Earth. These are two photos, the Earth rise captured by Apollo 8 on the left, and the small pale blue dot captured by Voyager 1. I love these two photos because it shows how beautiful yet small Earth is, doesn't it? But do you have any idea how small we are compared to the rest of the universe? How can you look at those two pictures and not realize that we need to be good stewards of our planet? That amongst all the sufferings reported on the media, we need to treat the other 7.7 .7 billion people with respect. We are all stuck on this small pale blue dot and it is our responsibility to take care of it. When it comes to these earthly problems, I'm sure you wouldn't mind spending a couple of extra dollars to feed hungry children. I know I wouldn't. 
But I don't think desisting from outer space necessarily solves these problems either. I would even go further to say that it helps us solve these earthly problems. Take, for example, the problem of hunger. There are two functions of this, the production and distribution of food. Food production, as we know, is linked to things such as agriculture, fishing, cattle ranching, and other things. And you know you can improve agriculture if you had more efficient ways to use fertilizer, to forecast weather, to select fields, and more. And guess what? The best tool to do all this is nothing greater than our bad boy, the satellite. Yes. And yes, it orbits Earth at a really high altitude, and it can screen a large area of land within a short time. It can help measure the condition of soil, rain, uh, rainfall, crops, and then it can report this information back down to Earth for appropriate use. And this by far would increase the yearly crops to equivalent of many millions of dollars. We are all about long-term efficiency here. Now, on the topic of pain and suffering, take a look at this. This is tropical cyclone Oma, and it was due to directly impact Queensland in February this year. But we now have the technology to track this nasty, swirling, murderous thing, and not only that, we can predict its trajectory. And that would save lots of lives, correct? But how about some weirder, subtle space benefits? Actually, a friend of mine recently asked me to name one, and I thought about it. You know, I could just say Velcro or smartphone, but I said two words, baby formula. It's going places, right? Yes, I know it sounds bad coming from an Asian, and it's not like we're sending babies into space or something. So, so what's the link? <laughs> well, there was a NASA researcher to attempt to determine how microalgae could be used as nutritional supplement on long-term space trips. And this resulted in the invention of Formulate, an algae-based vegetable like oil, which is now a critical component in baby formula. I know, right? And, <laughs> wait, I'm not done. When was the last time you had your temperature checked at the doctor's office? You had one of these ear thermometers stuck into your ear, right? Well, it seems quite irrelevant to space, but it actually is. You see, NASA was inventing an infrared sensor to measure the temperatures of stars far, far away. And through its technology affiliates program, they realized, you know, why don't we use this to measure body temperature? And so they modified the sensor so that it captures and measures our body temperature via energy given off our eardrums. And that's why we have ear thermometers today. And the list goes on and on. You know, there's athletic shoes that come from astronaut suit manufacturing and design processes, invisible braces, wireless headsets, which I'm wearing right now, and landmine removal, which I find ironically dangerous because you're using rocket fuel to burn a hole in the landmine without detonating it. Um, I've actually wanted to try this, particularly as an engineering student, but I think we can all agree that I'd probably kill myself in the process. <laughs> But we live in a pretty interesting time in society, don't we? Because the space industry is now becoming more privatized. And for some governments, such as our government, playing a more supportive role rather than spending big money on building rockets and other things. And the great thing is that we can then concentrate this money to fund other initiatives. Our current space sector is worth $3.9 billion with 10,000 employees, and that's meant to increase to 30,000 employees and a worth of $30 billion by 2030. Of course, we aren't rich enough to just throw billions of dollars into our space program, but by collaborating with our research and development sector, we start to see interesting startups, such as Gilmore Space Technologies, who are wanting to launch astronauts from home 
soil, or rockets rather, but hopefully astronauts soon. Our country is beautiful, isn't it? We have a unique view into the galaxy with such a geographical advantage. With this advantage, this means that we can be more independent with our national security interests, and we can monitor the condition of satellites to reduce the risk of satellite collision. And you can be involved in the development of our space industry. Well, how can you get involved if you don't do something spacey, or if you don't come from a space or science background? The great thing is that you don't actually have to take the conventional science, technology, engineering, or mathematics degree to be involved in space. In fact, it's always been broader than that. When Neil Armstrong walked on the moon nearly 50 years ago, it seems like the engineers and scientists get most of the credit. But wait a second, how about the people who helped purchase the raw material? How about the analysts, consultants, finance people that oversaw the budgeting process? How about the digital marketing team that helped promote the event? How about the human resources team that helped hire these brilliant engineers and scientists in the first place? Don't you think it's absurd that you have to do something sciencey just to work in the industry? When President John F. Kennedy was visiting, visiting the NASA headquarters in 1962, he met a janitor who was mopping the floor, and he asked what on earth he was doing at NASA. And, you know, the NASA, he could just say, well, Mr. President, I'm mopping the floor, what else would I be doing? But he said, well, Mr. President, I'm helping put a man on the moon. The brilliant part about this is that he understood the vision, his role in it, and his purpose. By cleaning the floors, this would ensure that scientists, engineers would have a clean environment to work in. Is he doing something STEM specific? No, but it's these little contributions that add up to the final product. But then you might be like, oi, I actually want to do something spacey, even though I don't come from the background, huh? <laughs> sure, why not? The brilliant thing is that there are now public volunteering science projects, which anyone from any background can be involved in. One of the more interesting examples is the Galaxy Zoo Citizen Science Project, which uses average people to classify galaxies using the Hubble telescope. There was a woman by the name of Hanny van Arkel, a Dutch school teacher who was looking at one of the pictures. And she noticed this weird squiggle blue blob thing, whatever you like to call it, and flagged it. And it turns out that this weird blue blob is a glowing cloud of gas, which is a really rare type of astronomical object. They named it Hanny's Vorweb, where Vorweb means thingy. It's not even a sciencey name. Like, come on, guys. And maybe you could be the next person to discover something big like this, right? Yeah, who saw this coming? Haters going to hate, but there is going to be more of this. <laughs> it's fascinating, isn't it? Space, after all, fills our innate desire to explore the unknown. And through our curiosity to see what is out there, we do and discover things that excel humanity into the future and broaden our understanding of the universe. Australia has an exciting time in space, and you need to be involved because space is for everyone. Thank you very much.